Dr. McNamara. Dr. Tracy McNamara is professor of pathology at Western University, um, uh, Western University uh, School of Veterinary Medicine. She specializes in the recognition and understanding of the diseases of captive and free-ranging wildlife and is best known for her work on the West Nile virus. Ma uh, Dr. McNamara served as senior zoo pathologist at the Bronx Zoo between 1987 and 2003. And um, we're absolutely thrilled and honored that Dr. McNamara will be presenting the keynote for us now. Thank you. Oh, good morning. Excited to be here. OK, Rudolf Virchow at the turn of the century had it right. He said, between animal and human medicine, there are no dividing lines, nor should there be. Those words are particularly applicable these days, where we face ever more increasing threats at the human, animal, and ecosystem interface. Zoonotic threats have been part of our lives for the past you know, 15 years. We've experienced uh, Nipah, vir Nipah virus, Hendra, SARS, monkeypox. And it, all of these demand a One Health approach. And there are very compelling reasons to close the gap between veterinary medicine and medical uh, human medicine. However, um, Probably the first wake-up call that we had that this needed to happen was in 1999, the West Nile virus story. And it was a, uh, we desperately needed a One Health approach. And this is a cautionary tale of what happens when that approach is not taken and the downside of not working together. But in 1999, we were completely unprepared to deal with a virus that crossed species lines. And, and we, we missed many opportunities to work together. So what I'm going to tell you about today is historical fact. It happened. And, but you have to keep in mind that that was long before we had meetings like Zubiquity. We've made a lot of progress since 1999, but those were different times. And, there were many lessons to be learned from the West Nile example. So what happened? OK, crows were dying early in June. Over 400 crows had been submitted to the New York State wildlife biologist who misdiagnosed them between early June and mid-August. I spoke with the uh, fellow and realized he had no formal training in pathology and said, OK, when it hit my collection, I realized I needed to do my own investigation. Little did I know that at the time zoo birds uh, were dying at the Bronx Zoo, people were dying in New York City. I didn't know that there, were, that there was a synchronicity of events taking place until Labor Day, when New York City announced an unusual outbreak of encephalitis that was killing New Yorkers, St. Louis encephalitis. That interested me because I was seeing encephalitis in my zoo patients, but I also knew that St. Louis encephalitis uh, does not kill birds, not the classic virus. Birds are asymptomatic reservoirs. And I began a, a sort of a, a series of deductive reasoning to try and figure out what was killing our, our birds, the crows and the zoo birds. Uh, I had the unique uh, advantage of working in a zoo setting where I was able to look across all species. Zoos always have petting zoos. Well, that meant we had domestic poultry. If we'd been dealing with Newcastle's disease or avian influenza, the two most likely viruses that could cause encephalitis in birds, the chickens should have been dying, and they weren't. Then if I went to mosquito-borne diseases, eastern equine encephalitis, that was a reasonable differential. But as luck would have it, the Bronx Zoo had a flock of emus, and emus are exquisitely sensitive to eastern equine encephalitis. And like the chickens, they were healthy. So I was able to systematically rule out all the potential veterinary di differentials for this virus. And um, 
I came to the conclusion when New York City announced their outbreak, I went, hmm, I wonder if there could be a link between the human and the animal events. And um, I called up the USDA, and the next phone call I made was to the CDC. And I explained that I thought there was a, that this was a new virus, that it was something new, to, certainly new to veterinary medicine, but I, I strongly believe there was a link to the human outbreak, and I begged them to sample, um, to test my flamingo samples. I was told in no uncertain terms that there was no possible relationship between my birds and the people dying in New York City, that I was just dealing with some veterinary thing, and that I should know better. Um, I, I asked again, well, isn't, isn't it possible there's a relationship? No. Can I speak with your supervisor? No. Um, and that's the only lab in the U.S. doing the testing. Understand that. That was my only option. And uh, then I was like, wait, 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 wait. Don't hang up on me. What do I tell my colleague? My, my veterinary clinical friend had stuck himself with a large bore needle that morning when he was euthanizing two encephalitic flamingos. I knew what this stuff did to a brain. And I was like, what do I tell him? He's got three kids. There was a pause on the phone line. And the head of biosafety, CDC Fort Collins, said, no treatment, no cure, say a prayer, hope for the best, and he hung up on me. That went on for three weeks. I finally woke up, and I was like, wait a minute, I need a place with biocontainment, with every reagent to every dangerous virus known to man, with the ability to create novel diagnostic tests. I'll call the Army. And that's what I did. I called up Fort Detrick, the US Army Medical Research Institute in Infectious Diseases, and in short order, all of a sudden, we had a new diagnosis, a virus that had never before been seen in the Western Hemisphere, and everything went nuts. I'll share with you one of my favorite cartoons from the period, Mayor Giuliani looking like Robert Duvall in Apocalypse Now. Instead of napalm, he's saying, I love the smell of malathion in the morning. You got the helicopters spraying. You got the, the guys in the trucks spraying. You have people running for the hills. I mean, you had to have lived through this to understand what hysteria gripped in New York City. And then my favorite uh, posting of all times on ProMed, they said they were finding dead cows along the side of the road. And I was like, oh my god, it's killing cows. And someone left the R out of the word crows. <laughs> but then we had to get down to the business of actually trying to create a surveillance system for an unknown threat. How do you do that? We didn't have a case definition. And this is where I thought that the animal studies could possibly inform public health actions. And in fact, we helped create the case definition for West Nile virus. There were many studies, many things that we found in our animal studies that were subsequently proven to be true and applicable to human health. Tissue tropism, species susceptibility, mammal feeding mosquitoes, biosafety concerns, alternative modes of transmission, long-term sequela of West Nile infection, viral persistence. Now, West Nile virus did affect the brain. That was no surprise. You're looking at the brain of a flamingo with massive cerebellar hemorrhage, lymphoplasmacytic, meningoencephalitis, Top slide, Cere <laughs> cerebellar hemorrhage, beautiful staining with West Nile antigen of the cerebellum, the Purkinje cell bodies and dendrites, the entire molecular cell layer of the cerebellum is lit up with West Nile antigen. It also affected brainstem neurons. And when I showed this slide to uh, physicians in New York City, they almost fell off their chairs because we also saw a lot of staining in the anterior horn nuclei of the spinal column, reminiscent of polio. And physicians had never believed the CDC diagnosis of St. Louis encephalitis because people presented with profound flaccid paralysis. St. Louis did not cause that. And this could have explained what was going on in the human patients. 
The thing is, it didn't just affect the nervous system. It also affected kidneys, adrenals, the pancreas, GI epithelium, ovarian tissue, testicular tissue, fibroblasts, smooth muscle cells. Look at that picture of the heart. I mean, a lot of animals presented with massive myocarditis. That's immunohistochemical staining on the right of the myocardium, devastating lesion. Cross-section of the intestine with all the staining of the crypt epithelial cells. A massive splenitis in a bird with splenic necrosis of the lymphoid tissue. So where do you start? What do you test? That's, that's the number one thing you have to figure out with a surveillance program is you need to get a positive diagnosis on which to base your spraying. And when we did a mounted, a major study at the Bronx Zoo and looked at all the animals that had died, we found that if you were only gonna test one tissue, it shouldn't be brain, it should be kidney, because they were positive 100% of the time. We'll come back to that at, later at the presentation. We were also concerned that public health only wanted to look at crows because uh, we showed that this virus hit a broad spectrum of species. Basically, if, you, if it was a bird, um, it had a good chance of being uh, West Nile susceptible. But we also found we had many positive mammals, and that led us to wonder whether we could, dealing, could be dealing with more than Culex pipians, a bird-feeding mosquito. Maybe some mammal-feeding mosquitoes were involved. They have different behaviors, different activities, and you have to spray at different times of the day to target some of those mosquito species. The biohazard risk, I'm very concerned about this. Everyone kept saying, oh, there's minimal risk, the birds pose no threat. I'm like, I'm looking at the microscope, it's brown. I mean, everything is lighting up with viral antigen. These birds are as hot as they can possibly be. And we had people running around and picking them up. I was worried about what it meant for veterinarians dealing with the live neurologic crows. We also postulated that there might be alternative modes of transmission, that something other than mosquito-borne transmission could be taking place with West Nile virus. That's because we saw so much viral antigen in the kidneys and in the intestinal tract. These birds were spewing virus into the environment. Uh, aerosol transmission has occurred in laboratories, so that was a possibility, given the amount of virus they were shedding. <laughs> The other possibility we wanted to investigate was that fecal-oral transmission was taking place between the birds, which would also change your epidemiology. We found very heavy staining in ovarian and testicular tissue. That made us wonder about the possibility of vertical transmission. Obviously, we were worried about it from the endangered species point of view, but we also wondered whether this could have any uh, importance for the human medical field. Most troubling of all was the fact that the Russians, who have done extensive research on West Nile virus, it is a biological weapon, um, had published a study in primates, and it was a massive study. And at the conclusion of it, they found that there was something peculiar to West Nile virus in that it was in its ability to cause chronic progressive neurodegenerative disease in symptomatic and asymptomatic primates. <clears throat> because I was at a zoo where every animal that dies undergoes a necropsy, I, was, I had the unique ability to take a look at the brains of animals that had survived initial West Nile virus infections. Three months after infection, we euthanized a snow leopard that never recovered from infection, really. It was continued neurologic signs, history of renal disease. That, ha that cat had lymphoplasmacytic perivascular cuffing, gliosis, and lymphoplasmacytic meningitis. A rhino, a greater Indian rhinoceros, that um, had been neurologic in September 99, and in June 2000, he was playing with a log and flipped it up in the air and it broke his neck. But he had never been right 
According to the, the keepers, he had never been the rhino he had once been before infection. And when I looked at his brains, eight months after infection, the lymphoplasmacytic perivascular cuffing I saw in his brain looked like he had been infected a week ago. <clears throat> 10 months after seroconversion, we had a babarusa, which is a, an Indonesian pig, never been neurologic. And yet, when we looked at the brain, that animal also had perivascular cuffing. We published our findings in the spring of 2000, hoping that public health would be able to learn from what we had um, gleaned from the animal studies and maybe um, do, some, do some experimental research where required. Unfortunately, we, the response was not what one might have hoped. Public health said we will only test brains, we will only test crows, and they maintained that West Nile virus could only be spread through the bite of a mosquito. In 1999, if you remember back to those days, CDC was telling people that this was a relatively mild illness, that it didn't bother the majority of people who were infected, maybe they get a slight fever, that it was mostly old people and the very young or the immunocompromised that were at risk that it was only spread through the bite of an infected mosquito, and that the neurologic illness was limited to meningitis and encephalitis. Three years later, we realized that this virus had not read any of the classical textbooks. <laughs> nothing about this virus, nothing that had been said about this virus had been proven to be true. At this point, CDC was doing an occupational hazard study of veterinarians because there were so many cases of West Nile virus in people who handled neurologic birds. Studies had been done showing that there, there was direct bird-to-bird -bird transmission, both oral and aerosol. We now knew that there were more than 39 species of mosquitoes that were involved in transmission of West Nile, many of whom were aggressive mammal feeders and daytime feeders. It was now in our blood supply. It was now being spread by organ, uh, organ transplantation. It was being shed transplacentally spread. It was in breast milk. Babies that were born with West Nile virus had profound neurologic disease. They defined a new syndrome of uh, poliomyelitis syndrome associated with West Nile virus infection, from which there was little recovery. And it tended to hit younger people, people in their 30s and 40s. And as we had suspected because of the animal studies, we now knew that long-term sequelae were an important feature of West Nile infection and very troubling. Many people reported disabling neurologic uh, sequelae to the infection, tremors, movement disorders, subjective cognitive problems in more than 50% of the people who survived West Nile encephalitis. Three years after the acute illness, with little recovery. You recover either within the first year or you don't. And the other scary thing is that they found a higher uh, mortality rate in people that experience West Nile virus than in the general public. West Nile fever, that had been deemed rather insignificant, something you could just sort of shake off like the flu. Well, the recent research shows that even people who had a very mild infection, healthy people, very healthy people, are now all at risk for chronic renal failure as, a, as a, a, an aftermath of West Nile virus infection. This work has come out of the University of Texas and Baylor Medical School, and NIH is doing a long-term retrospective study and a uh, longitudinal study following patients, and that's what this information came from. So 
many, many parallels between what we saw in the animal studies and what was subsequently found in the human studies. And one can only wonder if we'd been able to communicate with one another back in 99, could we have done experimental work that needed to be done at that time? Maybe we would have been able to get ahead of this curve. But those opportunities were missed because there was no discussion between the veterinary and the medical arenas. And the problem is, when it comes to emerging zoonoses, we're all in the same boat. Like I said to people when I'm trying to convince them that we need to take a One Health approach, that we need to be inclusive, all inclusive in our biosurveillance efforts, that if we don't do that, it's like, hey, okay, as long as you want to keep using taxpayers as sentinels, who am I to criticize? But, you know, I don't think the taxpayers know that's what we're doing. And um, the bottom line is, None of us know who or what may serve as sentinel for the next <laughs> emerging infectious virus. And it may be a lot closer to us than we think. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tracy. Do you want me to ask questions? Um, yeah, minutes? absolutely. Please, yes. Uh, we have some, a few minutes for questions. Yes. What we're seeing in Dallas this year, well, you know, the CDC says it's just an arbovirus and it's weather related. It's been extremely hot. Dallas actually is surrounded by a lot of bodies of water, which would breed mosquitoes. The mosquito counts are up. And um, these things are usually cyclical. The last bad year we had was in 2002 when we had a lot of deaths in Chicago and in uh, Denver, but and Colorado. Um, the problem is most of the funding for West Nile virus evaporated in those years when it wasn't a crisis. So now everybody wants answers. And I'm like, well, you know, if you paid for the studies, maybe you'd have some of those answers. But there's still a lot we don't know about the ecology of West Nile virus. Other questions? I know have they have vaccinations for horses now. Is there any um, progress in vaccinating for people? for this disease? Uh, they're, they've done human trials, but no vaccine is currently available. So it, you're, it's luck of the draw. You get bitten by a mosquito, you may get infected. You may get encephalitis. You may be permanently impaired, or you may just get a fever. We still don't know some of the risk factors and why certain people develop encephalitis and others get off with a very mild infection. Yes. Thank you. Who did the work in determining the number, the species of, of mosquitoes and so on? You, you, you know, obviously it was a Fort quick Dietrich. synopsis. Fort, Fort Dietrich, Dietrich did all did all of that as well. They did a, an awful lot of the mosquito work early on, uh -huh. and then uh, CDC Fort Collins also did mosquito work. So I've worked with Fort Dietrich in the past, and I was curious about your point of entry. Uh, you talked about CDC. Oh, yeah. um, this is funny. Um, <laughs> Usually is. I. <laughs> I knew someone who was being transferred. He was going to start working at um, Fort Detrick, and but he, you know, I wasn't able to get hold of him. So first, I just called the head of virology. I called their switchboard and got the head of virology and said, "Listen, this is killing people. CDC's not listening. We need to isolate and you know titrate, figure out. I, we know it's a flavivirus. USDA did that work, but we don't know which one, and we can't take it any further because it's something new to veterinary medicine." He said, "Send the samples tonight. We will work on them. No problem." And I said, "But you know what? I also need is to talk to one of your pathologists because I need to be able to do. We need to develop an immunohistochemical stain so we can do studies on pathogenesis." He said, "No problem." I'll I'll have Dr. Steele give you a call. And I went, Steele? Keith Steele? He's like, yes, do you know him? I was like, his wife did the residency in zoo pathology at the National Zoo. She was one of my externs, and I was at their wedding. Of course he'll take my samples. That's how I got into Fort Detrick.
luckily, you know. Um, but that's that's not a great, um, you know, <laughs> I, that wouldn't have worked for everybody. So uh, <laughs> that, uh, that was f uh, very fortunate. There, there was so much serendipity with West Nile virus and so much synchronicity. It was amazing. Um, Ian Lipkin, at the time I was working on my animal samples, he was uh, working on the brain samples that the people in New York State Department of Health gave him because they also didn't believe the St. Louis encephalitis uh, diagnosis and really it all came together the same night the animal studies the the work with the army the, the work by CDC the work by UC Irvine um, and it, it was an extraordinary experience but let's not forget we did miss it by two and a half months because it was misdiagnosed by someone who was working on free-ranging wildlife and you know we don't put a lot of stock or importance on wild crows. Who would have tolerated 400 dead animals and no diagnosis, except in wildlife? That was a problem. And I maintain today that free-ranging wildlife is our weakest link in the biosurveillance chain and represents one of the greatest threats to our national security because we don't apply the same criteria for competency and diagnostic wherewithal across species. And the bottom line is a sentinel is a sentinel is a sentinel, and you need a diagnosis. And then we lost an additional three weeks because of the misspeak between our two worlds. And if this had been a biological event, a bio, an intentional biological event, and I will share with you the public seemed to just not catch this, but it was 10 days before we knew whether it was or was not a weaponized strain of West Nile virus. The Army was all over this. The CIA was all over this. And, you know, if it was a dress rehearsal for our preparedness, we blew it. We failed. If we'd been on Broadway, we would have closed on the first night. So. You know, a, a real awakening, and um, unfortunately, lessons seem to be short-lived as, as far as the government is concerned, and the way they fund things is in a response to a crisis. And then when things quiet down, money goes away. So, you know, you, it, it, it's a knee-jerk response, and we get our funding every four years, and it's, it's no way to approach these threats, but it's the reality we have to deal with. Anything else? Yes. Has, has anybody done it? Has anybody done any work to to uh, figure out how it was introduced to North America? Well, um, you know, we import mosquitoes wholesale, and you know they come off of every plane and every you know cargo container. So it, it could easily have come in with mosquitoes. It could have come in with migratory birds. But Marcy Layton, the Assistant Commissioner of Health in New York City, Department of Health, went on the record saying she thinks it came in with two Israeli citizens who visited Queens, New York, in June. And the husband died of an undiagnosed encephalitis. The New York 99 strain was virtually identical to the one found in Israel the summer before. But in 1999, everybody said people were dead-end hosts. That's before we knew that wasn't true. So it's possible it came in with an infected human. And, um, but, the, but we'll never know. There, there are so many holes in our net. Um, you know, the, the way it could have got in here is just too numerous to count. And nothing has changed. So, yes? Well, I, you know, personally, I don't worry about horses very much because that is the one species for which we do have a vaccine. And um, we just have to convince our clients that they should be vaccinating. And um, there, there certainly has been a, a spike in equine cases with this recent outbreak because people, people are not. They don't have anywhere near as much virus as the birds. The birds have up to a trillion viral particles per ml of blood. Tom Monath of Acambus said it's unbelievable. You know, no 
arbovirus can gin up that level of viremia, these birds are like little flying germ warfare bombs. Yeah. Last question. Um, besides the equine vaccine, are there any other preventative measures that can be taken um, keeping this from invading a dense population like New York or a zoo or any similar Mosquito community? control. Mosquito control is, is critical. And the reason we had that outbreak in 99 in New York City is because they had discontinued their mosquito <laughs> abatement program and had not had one in eight years. But the problem is, when you do a great job and prevent disease outbreaks, then the mayor looks at your program and says, we don't need that because we don't have any arboviral outbreaks. So we're going to get rid of that, that cost factor. And I don't know whether that played a factor in what's going on in Dallas. I'd be interested in knowing whether they had aggressive mosquito control programs in place before this outbreak. Chances are the answer is no. Yeah. Long sleeves, DEET. <laughs> Dr. Okay. McEnroe, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> your story um, is um, always, whenever I give a One Health talk, an opportunity to really talk about, in real time, the threat and the opportunity that we have to change practices. And so we're all so grateful to you.